Hello, my name is Erdem Topsakal. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society Digital Communications. We are here in Los Angeles, California, and welcome to another episode of Legends of Electromagnetics. We are with Professor Yahya Rahmat Sami. Thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule. Thank you very much, Erdem. I welcome you to my office, and I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk about our uh, members and uh, let them know what my journey of life has been to get to this point of my life. And I'll be delighted to respond to your question as the best I can and hopefully making it also entertaining. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it as well. Well, I'd like to start with a question <coughs> about your background. So can you bring us from all of from your childhood uh, up to this day? Uh, how did you uh, choose engineering, specifically electrical engineering? And how did you choose to get into academia? Yeah, I guess uh, it's, it has been a long journey, of course. And the best way to probably initiate that is the fact that not going all the way back to when I was born, I probably don't remember all those details. Mm -hmm. But the details that I remember most vividly when I started my elementary school. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that some of those uh, memories are still with me is the fact that for some reason or others, even when I was in the second grade, I liked the math, and it was not obvious why, because my mom, she was more an artist side, and my father was a lawyer, and so, but then I gravitated towards math. And I remember that when I was in secondary, I mean, second grade, they invited me to go to the fifth grade and talk about math. Oh. Surprising, because they felt I had some passion about it. And that stayed with me. Then I graduated from my, let's say, elementary school and went to high school. And that uh, passion of uh, liking science and math got even more amplified. Mm. And that amplification was critical because the way things were done at those days, we had to choose the branches to go to, let's say, art or um, composition or writing go to the uh, bio type activities, medical direction, or math and science. So it was very uh, easy for me to be gravitated towards math and science. And that's the path that I chose. It just happened that I became number one student in my high school and all that. Then uh, we had to go and uh, go through a big exam. The way things were done, you had to go through entrance exam to enter the university. And uh, doing so uh, was pretty competitive mm -hmm. because there were all kinds of people from all over the country were participating mm -hmm. in those events. It just happened that past several of the universities that I had interest in. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I chose to go to the uh, University of Tehran, which mm -hmm. at that time was one of the best uh, universities in Iran, still is in some of the fields, of course. Then my journey started there, to be honest with you. And that journey was uh, very critically important components of that was my professors. So now we are going to discuss about some of the aspects of education. But I, as a student those days, remember the pro professors who left impact on me and really steered my interest even further in the direction that I like. Particularly, it was the... Uh, uh, math in uh, electromagnetics, which mm. really was just a very easy choice. Should I go to mechanical engineering? Should I go to civil engineering or others? But the choice was very easy for me because I created that passion mm. about math and electromagnetics at those days through the vector calculus and all that has most, uh, I would say, complex math, at least for me. And that was the reason I went in that direction. And then we had the several really outstanding professors who really uh, showed us uh, what these uh, Maxwell's equations are all about and how profoundly the outcome of this equation can affect mm -hmm. people's life, which it is. As we know, everything around us is based on electromagnetic waves, lights, and all that. And that really brought me to where I decided what should I do after I get my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate that the, whatever uh, situations were, that I was a kind of a top student and I didn't have to go to military service. 
So I made the decision then to go abroad. And of course, the U.S. was an obvious choice because uh, a lot of interesting things were happening in the U.S. And then uh, to make the selection where the university to go, since, again, I had a passion for electromagnetics, my choice of going to University of Illinois was uh, one of the easier choices for me because I knew some of the books by late Professor Jordan uh, about antennas and electromagnetics. So I decided to see if I can get uh, accepted to go to University of Illinois because it was uh, one of the best uh, universities in those days in electromagnetics. And um, so the journey brought me from uh, Iran to, to the U.S., and uh, that's where I started to see what I can do in this country. Another uh, really fortunate occasion was that at the University of Illinois, there were outstanding professors. Mm -hmm. Some of the giants of our field were there when I just started my uh, education in electromagnetics antennas, particularly Antenna Lab was pretty famous internationally. So those giants, uh, I really kept an amazing relationship with many of them. Of course, unfortunately, some of them have passed away, but even to the last days, I had uh, uh, interactions with them. So that's another interesting lesson that I really figure out myself. Uh, stay in touch with the people that you admire, and uh, that, at the end, is good for you. And also, they will be satisfied to hear from their mm -hmm. students if they believe they have been able to uh, work with them and contribute and all that. So uh, University of Illinois was a uh, really outstanding place for me because of those uh, outstanding professors, but also the environment. The environment was very pleasing. I must tell you, uh, up to now even, a lot of my classmates, which they were with me at that time, still I'm in touch with them. I mm. see them fortunately at many conferences at the IEEE Antennas on Propagation. We we in touch back and forth. As a matter of fact, this fall we are going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the University of Illinois Antenna Lab. And I'm going to be there and a lot of people are supposed to be there from different uh, decades uh, who have spent time at that uh, laboratory. So I'm really looking forward to see many, many of them. So then, uh, if I just continue, then uh, I did my master and PhD at University of Illinois. I worked with Professor Raj Mitra. But uh, along with that, I work with almost all of the professors, Professor Deschamps, Professor Lee, Professor Lowe, Professor Mays, you name it. All the giants were there, and I had the opportunity uh, occasions to work with them. I had papers with several of them, not just with my advisor alone. Then uh, it came the time, uh, so I got my degree, so I was very pleased that uh, things have worked out, and it was the path that I was creating for myself. We may come to that discussion later on, how you uh, position yourself in life, so we can discuss that later. But then uh, when I finished my PhD, it just happened that the, uh, because of my early interest in space and cosmos, uh, I probably didn't bring it up immediately when you asked the question, but something that I probably want to uh, talk about it. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, always the quotations from big scientists attracted me, always the life of scientists attracted me. I read a lot of books about life of scientists, and it was uh, my maybe big dream to become a scientist because uh, for some reason I was fascinated with their contribution and elegance of the work that they produced. So uh, that passion of space, uh, when the opportunity I uh, came that after my PhD to go and, and I applied to several places, and among them, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab was uh, probably uh, very intriguing to me. And the reason it was because, uh, as I said, the space was always mm -hmm. back of my mind. Two things, I must say, were back of my mind. <clears throat> One was the space, the vastness of the space, where do we come from, why are we here? The second one, the uh, uh, Darwin's evolutionary concept. These two uh, components were uh, somehow attracted me the most. 
and as we will later on we discuss about optimization and genetic algorithm, one of the reasons I gravitated in those directions is because of my interest to Darwinian evolutionary concept. So uh, perhaps uh, maybe we follow up the discussion on my career a little bit later, mm -hmm. but should I go now mm -hmm. to work at JPL, or maybe it's good to pause a little bit and see where do you like to go from here? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask you about uh, you know, some of your research uh, in, okay. in, in the academia. Uh, so if you can tie you know, right after your PhD, uh, you know, we know that you went to JPL, and then also the <coughs> academic life, and then what are the research areas that you started in the early days, and then how did you pick those areas? Uh, and then, you know, how your research evolved over the years? Yes, uh, excellent question. Yeah, so if we uh, march uh, from, uh, let's say, my research activities at the uh, University of Illinois and later on continuation at Jet Propulsion Lab. So I did, uh, because of the nature of the work that uh, where I was engaged, was more on numerical electromagnetics. And uh, we, were, we had a lot of success there. I was uh, very passionate about those as integral equations, at the moments, numerical solutions. And that was, uh, those days were the dawn of uh, these uh, concepts getting a lot of uh, um, attraction. And also uh, geometrical theory of diffraction, the, the notion that we can represent electromagnetic waves through ray picture and diffraction was also very fascinating. So I did research quite a bit on those areas when I was at the University of Illinois. And then when I was a kind of a uh, research assistant professor there after I got my PhD, I got involved in the areas of uh, reflector antennas. And uh, that also was pretty uh, interesting for me because the application that reflector antennas created was indeed, not only was in the part of the communication, which we all know, but also it was a key component for radio astronomy application. Mm -hmm. Again, gosh, mm -hmm. it was connecting me into space, so let's <laughs> get excited about yeah. it, which I did. And then uh, when the JPL opportunity came, so when I went to JPL, then uh, most of my work at JPL was focused on uh, reflector antennas. As a matter of fact, I was uh, involved either as a major player or as a, uh, involved in some um, uh, project the developments uh, that, that dealt with the antennas, large antennas. Those days we were working on antennas which was one of the largest. Like for example, one good example that I got involved very early when I went to Jet Propulsion Lab was working on this uh, Galileo mission mm -hmm. to, to Jupiter. And I was involved with other uh, members, of course, uh, developing the reflector antenna uh, mesh reflector, 4.8 meter, which at that time was the largest. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we were asked to measure this antenna very accurately. And uh, it was not an easy task because uh, these antennas were <coughs> very uh, expensive and very fragile because they were mesh reflector because they had to be deployed and they were supposed to be put on the shuttle to go into space and all that. So we had to develop a new concept how to measure these antennas. As a matter of fact, we developed a concept which got a lot of uh, attention. We call it plane polar um, near field measurements, that we measure the near field of, of this antenna in polar coordinates, which is different than what was done in the past, mm -hmm. which was rectangular coordinates. And that allowed us to measure this big antenna in a, in a chamber which was not huge, otherwise it would not have been possible. And uh, we measured amazing, we did an amazing measurement. We wrote several papers, came on the cover page of the uh, IEEE, I mean IEEE Antennas and Propagation Magazine and things like that. And uh, <clears throat> that was the uh, first time that I felt that the knowledge that we develop, it mm -hmm. can be really integrated to the real life application. And this real life application for me, my first real life application was for space. So you can see how these little dots from the mm -hmm. childhood mm -hmm. to that age and later on connected mm -hmm. each other and ultimately connected me to the space. And that the space uh, at JPL was of course one of their main missions are to go to 
space. Then I got involved in going, going missions to Saturn and then to Jupiter again, and then also remote sensing. So all of them necessitate reflector application. Mm -hmm. I was looking into my publication just recently for fun, both the papers and the uh, conference paper, and I noticed that among all my papers, 200 of them, they have the word reflector in their title. Mm -hmm. So that again shows my passion in this particular endeavor. So, uh, yeah, I think the JPL was great. Uh, I had a fantastic time there, amazing colleagues, which again, I'm still uh, in touch with them. I still collaborate with them on some project, which I really like very much. But then uh, uh, I noticed that when I was at the JPL, also I was very much involved in uh, IEEE activities. Uh, I probably was one of the, f some of the first uh, distinguished lecturer for IEEE APS who went to Europe and other places. Then I knew for fact that I enjoy teaching, expressing myself, and particularly uh, overlapping my activities with young people. So when the opportunity came and UCLA invited me if I wanted to join them as a full professor, I, uh, it didn't take too long to say yes. But there were two components to that. The major components was being a teacher, mm -hmm. working with the young students. <coughs> the second component was that JP wasn't too far away from uh, UCLA, almost uh, an hour drive. So I felt that I can keep my c connectivity with uh, JP, but at the same time being a professor at UCLA. So UCLA life was a blast. And the reason I felt it was a blast, because uh, when I started to teach in my classrooms, we probably may come back to those discussions a little bit later, I felt uh, I was very ready for it, that to come to the class and express myself. So I detailed that maybe a little bit more later when we discuss other parts of this uh, interview here. But uh, not only that, but also trying to create a new front of a research was also very attractive to me. So at UCLA, I continue my work, of course, on reflector antennas, not only for space application, mm -hmm. but also for, for, uh, for the uh, ground application, and more recently, even uh, linking it to the CubeSat and small sats and all that. So we developed an amazing number of uh, computational tools, which those days were probably one of the most sophisticated ones. And uh, they were really uh, helped us to develop a lot of interesting concepts, uh, uh, both in the analysis, synthesis, and measurements, I would say. So when we go to the lab, if we get time, so I'll show you some of the ranges that we have created, very unique, the only ones maybe in the world of that particular nature that allowed us to do all kind of uh, exciting uh, research. So, uh, of course, uh, being a professor, you are a professor, of course, very successful one. You know that you cannot just do one element of the research and forever do that because dynamic changes, interest changes, and uh, you have to stay uh, connected with what is new. So if you look at the history of my research work, you can see it covers a broad range of activities. <laughs> Maybe anecdotally I can say I work with the antennas, which are one millimeter cube for brain machine interface, to antennas which are maybe a 25 meter deployed in the space. So you can see the range is pretty broad. But in doing so, it's not only antennas, you have to also develop some interesting um, mathematical tools, numerical tools, conceptual yeah. tools, theories, which also was part of the disciplines that I was engaged in. So among them, uh, maybe uh, two components uh, got a lot of attention yeah. early time. One was on this uh, uh, starting point of uh, cell phones. So when we started this, uh, let's say 1990s, early, uh, there wasn't any cell phone that we are <laughs> looking at these days. There was the, the beginning of the game. And that beginning of the game uh, also um, was very critical because People were worried on the interaction of electromagnetic waves with the brain and all that. So our group did some of the first research in this area. As a matter of fact, our work came on the cover page of the uh, Proceedings of 
of the IEEE, which is one of the most uh, prestigious, uh, let's say, scientific journal that IEEE puts together. It's kind of a comprehensive, mm -hmm. covers different areas. So when that publication appeared, uh, so we got a lot of uh, notice on that from industry, from government, even the local news came and interviewed me that, oh wow, you guys are working on interaction of electromagnetic waves with brain mm -hmm. and all that. So, and the, also we were probably the first one who developed what is now called internal antenna. We called it back-mounted antennas, which it was not the classical whip antenna that you pull out of your cell phone. Mm. These were integrated mm. with the cell phone, and so now we see a uh, version of those early works now. You see the most every, uh, every uh, cell phones and all that. That w we had a big project on that with DARPA, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Samueli was very much involved together. We did all that, as you know, that he also created Broadcom. So that activity was really very fruitful. So uh, something for uh, maybe we discuss a bit later, for uh, when people go to universities, creating teams, especially powerful teams, multidisciplinary, mm -hmm will allow you to take your research to the next level. The other big uh, thing happened uh, as time passed by was in the era of the metamaterials. So at the outset, uh, that also was a very in interesting concept for us. Of course, we electrical engineers people, or antenna people, electromagnetics, have been aware of the notion of metamaterial concepts like frequency selective surfaces and all that, they have really have some uh, notions of metamaterial, but it was not called like that. But then this new wave of metamaterial in optics uh, came uh, to our uh, attention. Then we felt that electromagnetics people should play paramount role in that game because we had the experience, we had the know-how, and that was another path that my research took, that we got involved in metamaterials, in particular, utilization of metamaterials in the domain of uh, enhancing performance of uh, antennas. So I had some outstanding uh, students all the way through, still they are. And uh, one of the outcome of that was uh, we wrote a book and some very successful papers about metamaterial electromagnetic band gaps and all that. And then the other component was the uh, optimization. Uh, I probably, again, want to link you to my early childhood. When this notion of genetic algorithm started to give attention in the community of uh, people who do optimization, I very quickly got gravitated to it. Genetic algorithm, what is that? And then it was clear that genetic algorithm was uh, uh, designed or uh, orchestrated by utilizing the nature's uh, evolutionary procedures, and uh, so Darwinians. Mm -hmm. So it was, again, a very natural choice for me to get excited about it, which I did. And we did all kinds of work. So this uh, nature-inspired optimization technique was another uh, uh, platform that uh, our group really thrived, and uh, we, uh, we're still doing a lot of that different versions of that is keep on going uh, in, in, in that regime. And then the finally, another component which might uh, sound a little bit uh, not quite directly in the path which I was doing things is in the antenna measurements. So I always tell my students uh, measurements is a very um, uh, important part of the overall research when you do antennas, electromagnetics and all that. And indeed, when we did the antenna measurements, we developed a new concept for near field measurement. Particularly, we, we believe that we have contributed to the era of the antenna diagnostics. How do I use the radiated field of antenna and come back if my antenna is sick or, <laughs> or it is not sick? And that has been very successful, not only evaluating the characteristics of very large antenna for radio astronomy, we project back. We had a research project that we used the quasar as a source, mm -hmm. and when we moved the antenna with respect to the quasar, we got the 
perfect pattern amplitude and phase. We did the back projection because of Fourier transform relationship. And we're going to tell users that if their antenna is deformed or the panels have been moved with amazing accuracy. And that's not the, that is these days our main tools in order to calibrate these large antennas or small antennas. So we did a lot of that in my um, research as well. And uh, then there are a lot of connected, uh, I would say, attributes to all these uh, different fronts. So it took us to other directions as well. So, uh, so far, we have kept ourselves busy uh, evolving what the uh, technology demands, at the same time trying to bring new things into the focus that hopefully uh, will get our excited, uh, students excited and so forth. So all that research uh, resulted in hundreds of papers. Yeah. And uh, recently, uh, Transactions, uh, Antennas and Propagation, came up with a list of uh, papers, highly cited papers in different decades, starting from early 60s. So uh, when I read it, I saw two of your papers listed in the decade, which covers between 2002 and 2011. And I would like to ask about those papers. One of them has to do with the particle swarm optimization application in electromagnetics, and the other one uh, has to do with electromagnetic band gap structures. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of those two papers? Uh, I think the particle swarm optimization paper has over 2,600 citations, uh, which is an incredible number. And the other one has about over 1,200 uh, you know, the Google uh, citation. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, <laughs> you made me very happy with all of the, this beautiful news you brought up. I haven't uh, seen that uh, new, uh, uh, let's say, list of publication in decades and what paper got most attention and whatever. So it's uh, pleasing to hear that uh, two of our works in the era of uh, 2002 to 2011, as you have mentioned, have uh, got uh, cited as a potentially one of the most cited papers in that era, which is uh, really very pleasing. You know, I always tell myself, uh, starting myself and to others and my student, you know, the ultimate satisfaction that we as an educator and researcher get is when we get the approval from our colleagues. Mm -hmm. I think that to me is the most important because uh, those are the ones that you <clears throat> quote unquote compete with if I use that word, but at the same time, you enjoy collaborating with them. When you get their uh, recognition towards you and you get their blessing of what you're doing, it's really, to me, the ultimate satisfaction. Then, of course, awards come and all that, but to me, those are uh, more tangible when you uh, get your uh, uh, citation or your approval from your colleagues. Now, let's go back to those two papers. So the, actually, the story of particle swarm optimization is uh, very intriguing. Uh, I must say a few words just to uh, mm -hmm. let you know how it happened. Yeah. Uh, I, was <clears throat> I was a department chair at uh, UCLA Electrical and Computer Engineering from 2000 to 2005. And people were calling me, you are the uh, millennium <laughs> chair because we just started the new millennium. And then, uh, so you are, you've been a department chair yourself, uh, and you know that uh, periodically we go to this retreat, which all the department chairs from all over the U.S. come together. So I was in one of these retreats, a uh, nice place, I forget, maybe it was in San Diego or someplace. Then I was uh, at the dinner table uh, talking to another, I believe, department chair, and for some reason, uh, our uh, discussion evolved towards uh, optimization. Uh, then I got very excited that because <coughs> the other gentleman had, <coughs> excuse me, had a similar interest. Mm -hmm. So I told him about I'm um, doing a, a, a genetic algorithm because of Darwinian evolutionary uh, concept and all that. We have written a book and things like that. He said, no, 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 I also try to look at another optimization concept. Mm. I said, what? He says, uh, particle storm optimization. Oh, wow, what is that? Really, it's exactly what just happened. Yeah. And he was one of the pioneers of particle storm. Mm. But in, in the other areas, nothing to do with electromagnetics. 
So as we talked uh, during the dinner, I got very excited about the concept. So the concept was uh, very easy. Sometimes the easy concepts might have the most profound application. So concepts are, are like that. So you have a optimization space, let's say multi-dimensional optimization space, and your goal is to hopefully find the optimal solution if it exists. Mm -hmm. So you have to search your uh, platform uh, based on the multi-dimensional optimization uh, um, parameters that you have to seek for best parameters. So this concept was like this, which most all of the nature uh, optimization techniques are. You deploy agents, like uh, here we say deploy bees, bees, and then we try to uh, create a relationship among these bees through two simple equations. One is the where are they located, and then attaching velocity and let them uh, fly around. Okay, great. So what is the objective? The objective is that if these bees go and find the, where is the most fertile flower area, so that we call it an optimal solution. So these are poor bees on the computer, they fly around, so how you direct them to where is the optimal solution? Ah, the whole point is here. At any given time, you freeze all the bees, and you evaluate the fitness function. Let's say fitness function, if my patch antenna is having a good S11. So all of these um, several Bs, we assign a fitness value because of the location in this parameter space. So some may have better fitness, some may have bad fitness and so forth. That's good. So Bs remember that. <coughs> then uh, we statistically inject our velocity trajectory, so these bees start to fly again. And after they fly, we freeze them again. So we freeze them, then we ask uh, at that new location, what are their, um, uh, their um, fitness values? Okay, we get the new fitness values. Now, how do we go next? Uh, that's where the action it starts. Stops. These bees uh, are kind of clever. They remember where they had the best experience as they were flying. Oh, I remember there was a place that I really saw a lot of nice looking flowers. But at the same time, these bees, they talk to each other. So among them, they said there's a one bee who has the best fitness. So they, all these bees, we say, oh, we better fly there because that guy have already found the best place. So these two uh, forces statistically, where did I have my best experience at that time? and who has the best experience collectively, the redirects the trajectory. So these dynamics then move these bees to come to find the best solution and the uh, personal best and uh, global best determines where we are. Now, how did that happen to me then? When I came back, this idea just was intriguing for me. So I uh, then uh, accidentally an undergraduate on physics department uh, Mr. Robinson, he came and say, we heard uh, you, you do some interesting research. Can I work with you on something? I said, I evaluated him. He was a pretty bright student from physics department, undergrad, undergrad. And I got him excited about this particle swarm, really. And students like these things. It was not just, you know, you go and make a circuit. It was very conceptual, mm -hmm. something you know, ex exotic, you know, I must say. And he said, okay, I'm interested in that. And then we work and it, it just happened that our work brought us to this paper. So our goal when we wrote this paper, which now got but the highest, uh, let's say, citation among all my work with, the grad, with undergrad student, uh, the way we wrote this paper, our goal was to make it comprehensive and understandable to different communities, in particular our antenna. I think our paper on particle shore optimization in electromagnetic antenna was the first one, and that's why they got a, a lot of attention. Uh, that's another interesting thing that uh, I believe, uh, sometimes we borrow concepts from other areas, which may not be well understood in our areas. So if you as an educator or research paper writer can write that paper comprehensively in the sense that 
not only trying to please one or two people, rather please a broad spectrum of people, those papers would have a lot more mm. success. And this was a very good example mm. because our antenna community is limited and to get maybe 2,500 or whatever citations, it has to go beyond only our community. And this particular paper actually did. Now, uh, just uh, quickly maybe go to the electromagnetics band gap. I already gave you a little bit of a background how I got uh, engaged in uh, working with the electromagnetics band gap. And then uh, the question was that uh, people were talking about a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, fanfare about electromagnetics band gap, metamaterials. So we asked ourselves, what application can we consider could be useful? So we did all kinds of things. But among all of them, one of the papers got a lot of uh, attention was that we said, could we use this electromagnetic band gap and uh, improve the isolation among elements in an array. And uh, that was a paper which also got a lot of attention. So we were able to show that you need at least uh, four rows of these electromagnetic, uh, uh, let's say, substructures, which are uh, uh, under the wavelength, in order to get this notion of a band gap to be created effectively. So we said, OK, if you have uh, patches, if you p inject these uh, electromagnetic band gap structures among these uh, patches, you might be able to uh, reduce coupling among that. And that particular concept also was uh, pretty uh, innovative at those days. And now I hear that people are using it in uh, many different applications. Uh, of course, uh, electromagnetic band gaps, there are so many other applications that more recently we are doing beyond that, that particular paper, uh, transitioning to areas like a, like a transmitter array, reflector arrays. They're all under this umbrella of uh, metamaterials that our recent work is uh, engaged on. Thank you. Uh, also, the part of the big part of the academia is teaching. Uh, and <coughs> you have uh, uh, worked on many books and published books. I would like to uh, you know, show uh, our viewers a couple of those. And if you can tell us a little bit about you know, a very short story about these books. So uh, we have, I'm holding an electromagnetic optimization by genetic algorithms. Yes. Which again, <laughs> you know, that you have already mentioned. Exactly. Uh, so this was uh, also a very rewarding. And I work with Professor Mikkelsen. What year was this? Uh, this was uh, uh, mid 90s. Mid 90s. Mid 90s. Mid -90s. Yeah. And, uh, I think it was the first book in electromagnetics uh, community uh, concentrating on the optimization. It was an edited book, so we were able to bring a lot of uh, big players, those days who were working in the genetic algorithm, and that was uh, one of our... This also had a very high citations. Yeah. Uh, maybe if I recall uh, correctly, maybe not uh, uh, being too... <laughs> selfish about that, but maybe uh, 10 of our papers have more than 1,000 citations. So this book is one of them that has over 1,000 citations, right? <clears throat> and you had mentioned before the numerical electromagnetics work that you have done in the past. So I guess, you know, this book uh, yeah, this is a little bit advanced earlier. computational electromagnetic y methods and applications. Yes, yeah, so this probably, I don't re remember exact dates, but the 2012 or 13. So again, this was a combination of effort with a bunch of colleagues. And uh, this book is a pretty advanced book, I must say, in terms of a utilization of modern uh, numerical techniques uh, mm -hmm. and uh, has all kind of interesting chapters about the um, spectral domain techniques, uh, the method of moments, advanced method of moments, and other numerical work. <coughs> also, there are three clusters of books here I would like to you know show all <laughs> okay. of them at once here uh, so if you can tell us a little bit about each one of them oh yes uh, so these are a sequence of the books uh, the, this one is on the uh, impedance boundary conditions the generalized impedance boundary conditions which uh, we work with one of my PhD students uh, and uh, the middle one is, uh, we already talked about it, electromagnetics band gap. <clears throat> this book is very comprehensive. 
as all aspects of modern application of electromagnetic band gaps in electromagnetic antennas. And I give many short courses about this particular work. And the other one uh, on, uh, that you see is on the, what we call the electromagnetic surfaces. And that is the, one of the areas of paramount interest these days, how to synthesize artificial sur surfaces or meta surfaces in order to do something with your electromagnetic waves, uh, rerouting them, controlling reflection beyond the standard classical Snell's law and all that. So that hence the metamaterial and abnormalities of metamaterial characterizations. And last but not least, yes, medical uh, applications. Yeah, these are the medical applications, as I told you, are one of the areas still we are very uh, engaged in are uh, in the uh, areas of uh, medical application of antennas. Uh, the first one was one of my, my students and this was a, a kind of a monogram and it was uh, actually pretty well referenced as well. Mm -hmm. And we were some of the first one looking at implanted mm -hmm. antennas inside the body, its characterization, its performance, its safety issues and all that. And most recently, I'm uh, happy to say that this work was uh, co-edited with uh, Dr. Topsicle, who's here. And uh, <laughs> we believe this book is going to get a lot of attention. It's uh, good to mention that it's published by Wiley, but the entire book is in color. Usually you don't see that, but the Wiley felt it has an important topic and having a presenting it all in color might even give a better attention to the audience. So we are looking forward to uh, see how well this book is utilized in the research arena and also educational arena. Great. Also, of course, the book uh, is a uh, collaboration between Wiley and IEEE. That's uh, correct. Press. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yes. I should have mentioned that the IEEE is part of that the whole team who, who engaged in putting this kind of uh, hopefully interesting books. So my next question is about, you know, many awards that you have, we see some of them behind us. Uh, and uh, if I start talking about the list, you know, I'm afraid, you know, it's going to take too much time, but uh, you have received many of them. And uh, you have been a, a cornerstone of the society over the years, and everybody basically recognizes the name. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how Antennas and Provocation Society played a role? in your career over the years. Yes. You know, what are the kind of things that you have done throughout the years, you know, as part of the society? Uh, yes, uh, you know, indeed. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a really interesting point. In particular, I tried, and many uh, others are, uh, to amplify this notion that uh, you, you have to give service because you always benefited from other people's services that it benefited you. But at the same time, you have to reflect on that and you have to service and hopefully your contributions will uh, help others coming in the future. So for example, uh, I Itopoli I was uh, uh, definitely a society I gravitated very early mm -hmm. as a student mm -hmm. and then stayed in it. And that's another one that you have to stay in the organization in order to grow. We just, uh, a lot of students nowadays they are a student member, and after they finish, they just don't continue uh, their uh, membership. And that, to me, is really not very good, because then you get more away from this organization, and then it's hard to come back. So stay to be connected and engaged. So for my case, I'm now a life fellow, so you can assume that I've been with the society for a long time. But not only... Being uh, around the society, I wanted to be inside the society. That's another thing I tell my students when I teach them in research or my classroom. The first thing I tell them, uh, it's best to be inside the circle than outside the circle because then you are engaged. So IEEE, in particular, Antennas on Propagation, MTT, and uh, others, uh, I've been uh, quite active in them, but Antennas on Propagation was my main uh, home, I should say. So I service the in all kind of roles as an ADCOM member two times, uh, distinguished lecturer several occasions, and then uh, vice president, president, which are these are all elected positions. Again, as I mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. so that brings uh, 
a lot of uh, kind of a joy that you feel your members vote for you to get elected. Yeah. So hopefully uh, they mean what <laughs> when they vote. And so those opportunities was very critical uh, to hopefully elevate the role of the society and also stay engaged. Now, uh, in terms of the how I see things, why, for example, some of the research I do related to intention propagation, as I mentioned to you, I always uh, enjoy uh, remembering quotation, and mm. now at my age, I try to write some quotations, <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about my quotation. So there were one or two quotations which were paramount uh, in my life uh, journey, I would say, at least educational and research. One was by Einstein, who says, uh, when an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. So you can see how fundamental this is when you do the research. So I also tell my students, don't be shy. If you have an idea, you go and tell your advisor, I have this idea, your advisor says, oh, that's no good, no good. Don't panic. Uh, tell your advisor this quotation. When an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. Mm. Then they might give more attention to you because you might have something there. And another uh, kind of a complementary, uh, let's say, a point uh, that I was thinking about that always, uh, again, stayed with me, especially my experience at Jet Propulsion Lab, my other research, is by uh, quotation by Goddard. Goddard, as you know, is, uh, is the father of rocketry in the U.S. And he says, uh, it is hard to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. So you can see how beautifully it connects the several main things, dream, hope, and reality. And uh, when you work places like JPL or others, uh, universities, and you bring your uh, dream from nothing to where it's really implemented and deployed and used, that journey gets completed. But uh, these are all the stays with me in all my classes I repeat these quotations over and over just to make sure it maybe uh, gets attention by the students as well. Uh, let's see, uh, what else uh, you wanted to continue on great, that? Great quotes, great quotes. Well, uh, as academics, students are an integral part of our lives. And uh, I would like to ask you a question about uh, uh, underrepresented minorities, specifically women recruiting in uh, the academia. Uh, graduate students, even faculty members, sure. junior faculty and all that. Uh, and this is uh, uh, unfortunately a problem in the United States. May not be, you know, some other uh, countries around the world, but it is a problem. Uh, and I know it from the first hand, probably you will agree with me. So what is your take on that? You know, what are the things that the society can do, we can do as academics to attract more underrepresented minorities and women into electrical engineering and APS? I guess, uh, again, these are uh, all uh, vital uh, uh, points that uh, need to give uh, utmost attention. As you know, hopefully, or at least it appears that these days, these issues are a lot more in the forefront than in the past. And I'm, I'm hoping that the attention will uh, even given much more than what has been given in the past because now it's continuously being discussed, continuously being uh, attended to, but how successfully it can get implemented, that's another story that had to be, of course, uh, evaluated. Now, of course, uh, for me, uh, I can reply to this question even probably uh, more detailed to some extent, because I played the role of, let's say, president of IEEE Antennas and Propagation, Another society that I spent a lot of time was uh, uh, ERSI, International Union of Radio Science. Particularly, I serve as a president or chair of the uh, uh, USNC, United States National Committee of ERSI. And so those roles also demanded to give attention to these uh, topics. In particular, when I serve as a department chair, mm -hmm. which is even, you could bring more uh, influential uh, activities in uh, addressing this particular important problem. And that was the era of, let's say, 2000, 2005. And uh, 
we did our best. Of course, uh, it was very critical. We noticed that you have to create a role model. And that's, again, something that I consider throughout my whole life. You have to have a big uh, picture and maybe role models, and you strive to evolve in those directions. So how would you create a role model for underrepresented students or female students or others by hopefully bringing uh, educators who are, uh, are in the similar scenarios that they are? And uh, so we strived about that. Mm -hmm. So when I was a chair, we brought as reasonably possible female professors. But uh, unfortunately, underrepresented uh, other segments of the society, like uh, um, uh, African Americans or uh, Native Americans and all that, there aren't yet, at least in engineering, as many candidates that we can attract and bring in. We do our best, but uh, when you look at the composition of these schools, engineering, either UCLA or other places, even UCLA, hopefully we can do more because it's a public school. A lot of attentions are given, and California is very open on these issues. We want to do as best as we can, but it's limited. So we've done a lot better in the female part, but not in the other parts. Hopefully, future we will do better. But again, at the end, uh, it should be excitements there. It should be excitements that uh, because it's competitive, you know, you just don't want to say I want to bring somebody because of uh, gender considerations and all that. Yeah. They will not like that either yeah. because they want to believe when they are coming here, they are the top ones that uh, have been selected to come in. So in order to that selection pool to be a little bit more enhanced, mm -hmm. it has to be grown up. So we have to make sure students uh, do get excited about engineering and so forth and so on. Now, one thing we see now, maybe you also see it in your university, this uh, bioengineering has uh, really changed the dynamics to some extent. In particular, the female students are gravitated more towards bioengineering. And hopefully, because now they apply more, so the pool is bigger, and hopefully they graduate and they go to academia to teach others. So creating a role model and stick to it is a very important part of our growth if we want this area to evolve. And you see also, you have seen it very well in our IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society. Similar to others, there are a lot of opportunities now created, particularly for underrepresented and female researchers to get them excited, to get them engaged, to give them the platform to show. And we see in our community particularly, some of our female researchers are our best. So it, it shows that the, the, uh, the capability is there. It has to be just identified and nurtured and made it more uh, vital for sure. Yeah. Great points. I totally agree with you. Uh, that brings us to my final question, which has to do with work-life balance. You know how they say, work hard, play harder. <laughs> so uh, what do you do uh, to wind down and, you know, hobbies, different things that you do outside, you know, uh, the school that yeah. people are not familiar with? I know that you're a great dancer, <laughs> you know, uh, and I know that you play tennis. If you can tell us a little bit about those hobbies. Yeah, I guess... Uh, uh, you know, in life, uh, I always think you want to be multidisciplinary. <laughs> and this multidisciplinary makes you a little bit broader. You can communicate can. with more people. You can engage uh, talking to more people and so forth. So let me start uh, uh, one point which resonates to points that you made. When I was a department chair, I was asked uh, to give a luncheon talk at the Rotary Club in Beverly Hills, one of the most supposedly sophisticated uh, organization here in Beverly Hills. And the luncheon was arranged to be at the uh, Beverly Hotel on Sunset Boulevard, very classic hotel, Beverly Hotel, right? Beverly Hills Hotel. And uh, then they asked me to give a talk at the luncheon. And then I asked them, why did you invite me to do that? Go, well, we heard you are a professor, you are the department chair, we want to see what you do, so it might be interesting. 
for the people uh, for that particular uh, segment. And I said, who are the participants? Uh, they said uh, mainly some celebrities, some uh, bankers. There's no engineers in that lunch. Huh? So uh, really, it's a, it's a truth the story. And then uh, I asked myself, how can I excite these people? Mm -hmm. What I'm going to talk about? So the night before, this is several years back, and uh, of course, I came with the idea, and the idea was like that. Uh, I told them, and it really worked. So I just want to excite other people. Give a lot of attention to your audience, mm -hmm. because if the audience cannot resonate with you, then they just uh, sleep or they work with the cell phones. Those days were not as many cell phones, but still they could occupy themselves. So I, I started my talk like this, true. I said, like Van Gogh, who used his brushes uh, uh, to paint his painting on canvas, electromagnetic scientists and engineers are artists who use their antennas to paint the electromagnetic waves throughout the universe. Oh, all of a sudden they all relax. They consider me as an artist, not an engineer. <laughs> then they appreciated my antenna is my brush, that I'm brushing electromagnetic waves, not only on the canvas, but in the entire universe, all my electromagnetic. And they relax immediately. So then uh, it really went really well. So that, that, that's a, a point that I always think is very important to get engaged. So, but from childhood, they always art, sports in particular, was paramountly exciting for me. I was in all kinds of teams when I was in high school and all that. And then uh, when I came to the US, then uh, I started to get more engaged in uh, activities. Uh, when back home, I was uh, very good at playing ping pong. I was in tournaments and all that. But then when I came here, my racket got bigger. <laughs> so I started to play tennis. tennis okay. And that uh, got me really excited. and. Uh, still I'm playing every weekend as much as time allows me to do that. But we had one very uh, opportune uh, occasion when I was at JPL. We had a team. Uh, that's a team of JPL tennis team at some level in, uh, in the national tennis ranking. And then our team uh, became number one in the Southern California. And they sent us to uh, East Coast to play uh, nationally. And our team uh, came uh, to be uh, actually uh, number three in the nation. And that is uh, my highest <laughs> achievement in, in tennis. As a matter of fact, I have that the little yeah, plaque we'll up that. there. Yeah. And uh, that the plaque is <laughs> that uh, our team became number four. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, CBS, local news, came and interviewed me at JPL. <laughs> they said, oh, you guys are scientists. How come you do this kind of thing? And that was really a pretty interesting. They, they televised that in the local news. So that was the highlight of my sports. But still, I pursue as much as I can. I do enjoy watching games in you know, basketball, you name it, all kinds of games. And uh, so again, UCLA was a very attractive place for me. As you know, UCLA right now is uh, ranked number one public school in the US in the last five years. And also, they have a, a second highest number of NCAA championship. We just won one uh, two weeks ago, the men's uh, volleyball. So we have 121 NCAA championships, which is only behind Stanford. They have two more from us, but I'm pretty sure we can catch them. We did. At some point, we were number one. So uh, this school has a lot of attraction for me from sports part and from a dynamic research and excellent students that uh, I really have enjoyed working with them uh, very much, very yeah. much. Okay, thank you so much, Yahya. Okay. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed the interview. Well, uh, this concludes our interview with Professor Yahya Rahmat Sami. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy.